Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Open Classroom. I'm Janet Gilla, the Director of Professional Development for the Brown School here at Washington University in St. Louis. And we are so happy to have you with us as part of today's program. For those of you joining on Zoom, you're probably familiar with this by now, but we're using a, a webinar format um, in that we cannot see or hear the audience. We also cannot call on raise hands, but chat is enabled and we do want this presentation to be as interactive as possible. So please feel free to post your questions and comments at any point during the presentation. And there will be some time towards the end to bring your voice into this room. I um, want to extend a welcome to anybody joining on YouTube, either right now through the live stream or maybe catching this at a time that's more convenient for you. We are not able to moderate Q&A through YouTube, though. So I want to let you know a couple of things that are coming up uh, for Open Classroom. These are free programs that are intended for anybody and everybody. We hope that um, you will find them interesting and valuable and that maybe you'll find something to come back for. So we'll be back on next Wednesday. That's April the 13th. Uh, a program called Harnessing the Power of Digital Technology to Support and Improve Treatment Outcomes in Patients with Tuberculosis in Uganda. And then on Thursday, April the 14th, Dr. Rupang Ann is going to be delivering a program called Artificial Intelligence for Everyone. So um, those are free and open for registration on the website. I'll throw a link in chat in just a second. But today's panel is really cool, and this is something we've not done before. This is a panel from inside and outside our university involved in evaluation and research that's happening in our community right now in the context of COVID-19. We're joined by five panelists with different perspectives on this work. And to get us started, I'm delighted to hand the microphone over to the principal project investigator, Dr. Christina Gurnett. Chris? Great. Thank you so much for having us. Um, we're really excited to tell you about this kind of extraordinary opportunity that we had to partner um, with the with folks at the Brown School and the Evaluation Center and the Health Communications Research Lab. Um, and the project does extend even beyond the borders of St. Louis. So I'll, I'll um, open up by telling you a little bit about the project, and then I'm going to hand over the presentation to Kelly Bana, who's going to tell who's a research coordinator and who's actually out in the field every day doing this work. She'll tell you a little bit more about the hands-on activities, and then we'll turn to Liz Vestal from the uh, Valuation Center at Brown School, who will tell you more about um, the uh, focus group findings. And then at the end, we'll have a panel um, and hopefully have some nice discussion on what this means for other children around the uh, country and around the world. Uh, next slide, please, Liz. Um, so as you all know, um, everyone's been um, extremely uh, impacted by COVID-19. Anyone that has children knows that this has been really challenging to deal with how to keep schools open safely and how to get how to deliver all the educational needs of children during a pandemic. Um, but children with developmental disabilities have been even been more disproportionately impacted due to special health considerations and um, uh, challenges in the school setting. Next slide. So certainly we know from a medical standpoint that the fatality rate has been much higher for individuals who have intellectual and developmental disabilities. Some very early work showed the rates were almost it, almost tenfold higher of mortality and hospitalization in individuals who have these other medical, um, medical health problems. We also know that kids with disabilities, um, they don't just get their education at school, they get a lot of other things, including occupational physical therapy, um, socialization, uh, healthcare services are often delivered at school, um, uh, detection of medical risk and other problems that might arise um, because um, these kids have such complicated health needs. And then certainly also nutrition. And, and therefore, this has really been a huge impact and burden on families, not only in our communities, but throughout the world. Next slide. Uh, you know, we, we noticed very early on, um, anyone who's taking care of kids with disabilities knew that this was going to be a particular challenge. Um, they're difficult. There's challenges in wearing face masks for all kids, but particularly those with disabilities. Um, many of the children who we'll be talking about in this um, particular webinar are kids with significant health disabilities um, and need a lot of assistance with daily living, including uh, feeding and uh, toileting. And this has really hindered the ability to do social distancing in this type of school setting. A lot of the children have troubles with, um, or 
or need assistance with their hand hygiene. And as I mentioned, the school, these school environments are very complex. It's not just the teachers in the schools, but there are lots of aides, therapists, bus drivers, cafeteria workers, custodians, lots of people coming and going in the school setting. And how do we keep those people as well as the children safe? Um, and we also know that children who um, are nonverbal also can't report whether they're having symptoms. And so illness comes on very quickly um, in these kids as well. Next slide. So the opportunity arose early in the pandemic. People recognized that there was a, a need to develop methods to test for the virus and that this might be a way to get out of the pandemic along with vaccination strategies. And so the National Institutes of Health um, had a funding opportunity to see what we could do to look at um, particularly vulnerable populations, including children with disabilities, and how we could encourage and use testing in the schools or in other environments to keep these vulnerable populations safe. Next slide. Uh, so we became very interested in applying for this grant um, because around the same time with the Washington University um, McDonald Genome Institute and investigators in the Department of Genetics were developing a saliva-based COVID testing. Um, and this was very successful. Uh, they were one of the very first um, PCR-based tests to be FDA approved. Um, which allowed us to offer this saliva-based test for this research study, as well as a couple other research studies at Washington University and the undergrad testing that some of you may have been aware of was happening at the, the WashU undergraduate campus. Um, all of these tests um, have been run on campus on the medical campus and continue to be run every day of the week on the medical campus uh, at the cost of about $26 a test. Um, and this is really the basis by which we were able to offer testing as part of this research study. Next slide. And so we have been partnering with the special school district of St. Louis County, which has been a tremendous um, partner and asset, a really great resource for our community. If you're not a, familiar with the services that the amazing teachers and educators provide for um, in this case, about 900 students across uh, five schools within the region. Um, and what we have mapped on the left, a lot of you will remember very early on in the pandemic, it became very clear that um, a lot of the North County and North St. Louis region had much higher rates of COVID and higher rates of hospitalizations. And we were very pleased that um, the part, by partnering with the Special School District of St. Louis County, we could um, offer this surveillance testing to all students and to all staff at these schools, which represent geographic um, and other um, uh, ethnic diversity in our region. And then the, I'll turn this over to Kelly, but then the real main goal of our study was to figure out how we could encourage testing uptake in this, um, in this school environment. Uh, this was all voluntary testing um, and we were using communication strategies and testing communication strategies to see how we could um, best reach families and get them interested in doing and and staff and get them interested in doing the study so i'll turn this over to kelly um, to tell you more about the hands-on activities of the test thank you dr granite and hello everybody uh, my name is Kelly Bono, and I am a clinical research coordinator at Washington University. Uh, I'm part of the testing, the testing team, um, and you can see many of them right here, my teammates. And so it was our job to go out into the school every week and run the daily operations of the testing program into the schools. So we were uh, working with five different um, schools and, and special school districts. We visited each one. Uh, one morning a week. And while we were there, we would collect saliva samples from the staff and students. We would uh, prepare those uh, samples for the lab, all the data entry that was necessary, and then we would deliver them to the lab um, at, uh, before noon. And so we were very consistently, um, almost always really able to um, provide next day results for uh, our participant, I'm sorry, not next day, but same day results for participants. So usually by the evening, um, there were results from the tests that they had taken that morning. Uh, those results were communicated uh, directly by email if they were negative. And if there was a positive result, that would come from a phone call from typically one of the physicians on the study. 
And so they were able to talk with the physician and get uh, some information. And uh, we also communicated that to the schools as well, if they were positive, so that they could take care of any necessary procedures that they were, uh, that they needed to do. So um, if you look at our next slide, you'll see uh, what our testing kit looks like. This uh, image on the left is a handout that we provided to staff. And so you can see that there's a funnel that attaches to the tube where you're able to kind of drill the saliva down into the tube. And so staff was able to collect that on their own. Many of them did it at home. Some of them would do it in their classroom before, uh, before school. And so we were there before school and uh, at the beginning of the school day as well to collect those samples in a central location in the school. Um, students were a little bit different. So um, we tried to get those students as they were coming off the bus because the way our test works, um, in order for uh, it to be accurate, we would have to have a period of 30 minutes with no food and drink uh, so that the sample wouldn't be contaminated. And so our best bet was to get students as they were coming off of the bus because many had long bus rides. So we, we knew many students were going to be independent, but others uh, were not. They didn't have the social or the receptive language skills or the, um, the motor skills to uh, put the spit into the tube on their own. And so um, our teammates uh, figured out a way to extract the saliva from their mouths using uh, the sponge or the pipette that you see here. And so we were able to do that um, you know, comfortably for the student. And um, that kind of us, uh, you know, that kind of helped us overcome a little barrier that we were facing. And so um, we also created some uh, visual instructions that you can see pictured here. And there were also social stories that we sent home for students that would benefit from that so that their parents could go over uh, the testing and what to expect. So they weren't surprised uh, if they were off the routine at the, uh, you know, at school the next day. And we also had trusted staff members uh, attending with the students. So when we would collect the sample, they were able to, you know, tell us how to interact with the student give us tips um, and also just be there for comfort for the student. And it went really well. And they were such an asset and made test collection really easily. On our next slide, you can see um, something about our enrollment. So participation in our study overall was about 50% of the entire school population. And you could see that enrollment was much higher for staff uh, than students. So we had, um, the staff had very easy access to us. Uh, they could just pop down into the classroom, but with, uh, especially at first there were, uh, I think when we first started, um, the students weren't actually in school yet. So we had a barrier in reaching out to parents and getting them involved, especially when they couldn't visit us in the school. Um, we tried to overcome that by having a, um, a phone consent available, but it was just still really hard to get parents on the phone. And I'm sure that the school can tell you that, but we um, that's something we can talk about a little bit later too. Um, and it, the next slide, you'll see that um, this is why we were doing the program. So you can see with our students, nearly all of them had a underlying risk factor, um, a health factor that would uh, put them at greater risk, as the CD CDC described, for uh, having a severe outcome from COVID-19. And then on the left, you can see that um, really half the staff had uh, similar conditions or conditions that would put them at high risk. Um, many of them having more than one. Okay, next slide. So a few things that we learned from our testing program. Um, the first and foremost was that trusting relationships um, were and, and continue to be the key to our program running successfully. So we tried to be consistent and responsive and respectful to everyone involved in the school, the parents, the students. And so as those relationships grew, um, our testing became much easier um, and our relationships with the schools, I think, um, grew as well. So focusing on testing accessibility for students of greater need really ended up benefiting everybody, as you see on the second point. So we're talking about uh, visual instructions, for example, even, you know, even grownups, even I uh, benefit from visual instructions. Having the pipette 
came in handy for some students that were really grossed out by spitting into a cup. And so they would go off in a corner and just extract the saliva themselves. Um, and that was something that we didn't really expect to happen. Um, and then just like flexibility and timing. Some kids like couldn't do it when they got off the bus, they were upset or um, something. So we'd circle back in a little bit and try to collect the test, but the staff benefited from that sort of flexibility as well. Um, saliva sample collection was really very easy is another point that we learned and really anybody could do it, I think. Um, so it, it's something to think about if, you know, you wanted to train somebody in this. Um, and then participants, uh, overwhelmingly, uh, especially the adults that would communicate this to us, they overwhelmingly preferred the saliva to the, um, to the nasal swabs that you could get through the health department. But there were some cases where the nasal swab was maybe a, the best bet for an individual. So I'm thinking of um, certain staff that had medical conditions or were taking medications that caused like severe dry mouth. It was almost impossible for them to provide a sample. Um, also with like very food driven kids, it was really hard um, if they were snacking a lot to catch them at a time where they hadn't gone 30 minutes or, you know, without eating or drinking. So for those students, it was really hard to get a clean sample from them. Um, so before I hand it over to Liz, I was going to show you a few things about uh, related to our participation. So in this graph, you can see um, how our participation changed uh, during the course of well, our first 48 weeks. And so uh, the staff represented in blue, um, you could see were very much impacted by things that were happening in the community. So um, notably, when you look at the, the decrease that starts to begin at the end of the spring semester of last school year, um, that followed um, vaccine availability for teachers. And some of them, because they had um, risk factors, were able to be vaccinated sooner. Um, but you could see that decline all the way through the end of the school year. Um, once the school year began, Delta was surging. And so you could see an immediate like whoop, uptake uh, in interest and participation. Um, and then again, when Omicron hits, you could see that really, really high peak um, at the end of last calendar year, heading into the holidays. Uh, with students, they were much more consistent with testing. Um, you can see that, that the, the red bar starts later because we weren't testing students at first. We had a period, like a trial period, just with staff. Um, and then you can see that um, after the school year begins, where that dip is, that was where staff uh, was in the building without students prior to the beginning of the school year. So you can see that testing um, stayed pretty constant with students, but at a greater rate because more students were back in the building, I think was why we could see that increase there. And if you look at the next slide. So here we're seeing, um, we're comparing surveillance testing positivity rates uh, compared to other testing that was happening in the region, other surveillance testing. So you can see the undergraduate program that Dr. Gurnett mentioned earlier with the red bar, ours is in blue, our testing program is in blue. The red line represents um, the WashU undergraduate testing program, which we only have data for until the end of last school year. Um, and then in green, you'll notice children hospitals asymptomatic pre-procedural positivity rate. Um, so one thing that is notable here, you can definitely see Omicron in that big uh, bump that we get, but also, it's interesting that children's hospitals um, increases happen a few weeks ahead of the increases that we saw in positivity in our population. And on this last slide, uh, you'll see, um, we're gonna look at the positives that were reported by special school district over all five participating schools. So this is all of the results from all the schools. And so you can see that more positives were identified um, like outside of our study than inside of our study, outside of our studies represented in red. Um, so staff and students, there might be a few that were not represented in blue if they tested over the weekend um, or on a holiday, but overwhelmingly um, positives were occurring outside of our study. So it would be interesting to learn why we don't have the data uh, to tell us, but why that was occurring. Uh, we don't know if maybe the staff that was participating was more careful or what the impact of our study had on that. Did it modify, help them modify five behaviors? 
Um, so that was something really interesting that we found with our participation. And with that, I'm going to tell or give it over to Liz Bestel. Thanks, Kelly. Appreciate it. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being with us. My name is Liz Vestal. I'm an evaluation manager at the Evaluation Center, which is housed in the Brown School of Social Work at WashU. And so our role at the Evaluation Center throughout this project over the last couple of years has been to really share and understand what the full experience of COVID-19 has been like for the special school district community. Just quickly for those who are just learning about the Evaluation Center, our mission is to advance evaluation science and practice to help organizations create lasting social impact. And so a lot of our collaborations with our partners include things like strategic and evaluation planning, data collection and analysis, and then using data for decision making and improvement. Um, we're always trying to meet our partners where they're at with their own capacity and research. Um, and so we're hoping to use the findings from the focus groups we had with parents and staff uh, to inform both testing implementation at the special school district and then to create broader guidelines for how best to support students uh, with disabilities throughout the pandemic. So throughout our discussion sessions, um, we had a few different objectives. Um, the first being just to understand the overall impact of what COVID-19 has been like for the SSD community. And then also to understand barriers and facilitators to participation in both COVID-19 testing and COVID-19 vaccination. And then more broadly, to learn how best to talk about COVID-19 with the SSD community. So we spoke to folks at two different time points um, and the context was very different for both of those. So during that first year, uh, it was fall of 2020. We spoke with 81 folks. Um, and as Kelly mentioned, the staff had uh, kind of piloted this program of testing before it ramped up for students. Um, so staff had ex access to testing while students did not at this point. And then vaccines had not yet rolled out. Um, it was definitely a difference uh, going into the second year, which was just as recently as February of this year where we were able to speak with 155 people um, and all had uh, both testing in the schools as well as vaccines available to them. So we were you know, curious about what uh, the experience has been like for folks as they came back to school in person. You know, the previous school year, uh, folks had, been, uh, had a choice, right? They could uh, remain virtual or be in person at school. And this year, Everyone has been in person at school uh, for, by and large, um, the virtual option um, was not available through the special school district. And so um, if students wanted or needed to have a virtual option, they were kind of folded into the virtual option provided by the state, um, which certainly did not accommodate the unique needs of many of the SSD students. So there were a lot of risks that were top of mind um, for the parents and staff we spoke with, first of which um, those challenges implementing social hygiene and mitigate, mitigation strategies for masking and social distancing because of the hand over hand care that many students require, right? Um, we know that quarantine and contact tracing have been difficult throughout the entire pandemic, um, but especially this year, again, with more folks just being in the building, um, it was harder to implement some of the contact tracing procedures and to remember who you were in contact with throughout the day. Um, and then as science and recommendations changed, so did policies and they were confusing and, and hard to keep up with. Um, I know even, you know, for myself, that was hard to keep up with, um, but thinking about all the different people in your household and all of their underlying conditions, um, it was, it was certainly top of mind for folks. And then lastly, just contracting the virus itself, um, especially for students with disabilities who had that higher risk of severe complications if they were to, to test positive, as well as other high-risk individuals living in the household. Um, those were the main risks that we heard from folks. And uh, a couple of quotes to 
elucidate those themes. Um, one parent sharing about their son being nonverbal. And so he had issues with impulse control. He's still learning things about personal boundaries. So difficult for all folks to implement the social distancing that's recommended. And then one staff member spoke to some of the challenges with quarantining. Um, she said that there was a week where she was only able to see three of her 45 students due to quarantines and case positive cases. Again, consistent with the surge um, from the Omicron variant. Now that's not to say that there's not a lot of benefits about being in school. And we definitely heard over and over again about those. Um, so as Dr. Gurnett mentioned, you know, not only having access to school and learning, but also those therapies that are essential and that students are not able to access anywhere else. So things like PT, OT, and speech therapy um, are really essential to the development of these students. And they miss out on those if they were um, on quarantine or weren't able to be at school. Also just the trusting relationships that folks are able to develop. Um, it's just much easier in person, right? Not only between staff and their colleagues, but also with students and families and the teachers and staff who support them. And then the, all of the increased social and emotional benefits we all get from seeing one another and being around one another uh, was certainly felt um, a lack thereof when folks were virtual. Another quote here just from a staff member commenting on the noticeable differences in behaviors and work stamina across years for those folks who weren't able to be at school. And then we also wanted to talk a little bit about communication findings, um, things that are, might be generalizable to you all, um, thinking about you know, where to go for information. Um, Folks really noted that they reached out to school nurses first and foremost uh, about any of the guidance and recommendation for what they should do at school, followed by teachers and case managers and then their principals. For general COVID-19 information, people turn to the CDC and Dr. Fauci, as well as their primary care physicians and other healthcare professionals in their life, especially those who knew the unique needs of their students. And then for test results, people overwhelmingly wanted to hear um, either that phone call if there was a positive result or an email from a member of the testing team like Kelly. Next, I just wanted to share with you all, there were definitely some distinctions across our two time points. So I just wanted to share some of the things that stood out the most to us. Um, first, you know, I think there was some sort of semblance of normalcy at the beginning of this school year, um, right? And then, especially after winter break when the Omicron surge began, um, it just kind of felt like we were going back to March, 2020 and that we had to start all over again. Next, uh, some of the schools have relaxed some mitigation strategies this year. So things like regular deep cleaning, um, things like being, you know, students being in smaller pods and, you know, not leaving their classroom to eat lunch in the cafeteria, but just staying in one place um, hasn't you know, always been feasible this school year. Also that pandemic fatigue, which I know I think we all <laughs> have at this point, um, but certainly has impacted the morale um, of folks in the school community, especially as there are staff shortages when staff need to quarantine and be out. And then lastly, um, vaccines, you know, as they became available, really helped to increase people's comfort level with being in person at school but it was also challenging to keep up with CDC's changing guidelines on recommendations for quarantine and isolation periods, especially that kind of trickle down period from when those recommendations uh, would turn into school level policy and that in-between period was, was confusing. So based on everything that we've learned, uh, we've developed some recommendations um, for those who are working with students with disabilities now and in the future. Um, first, right, to stay in school to the extent possible. In-person education is much preferred over virtual. Also to have that flexibility and the infrastructure for switching to virtual days as needed. And you know, one parent saying, you know, just like we have snow days, we should just say, okay, today's a virtual day and have access to the technology and the supplies that you need to be able to do that. 
also continuing to provide access to testing. That testing really provided a peace of mind and comfort to folks. Um, and so knowing that they have access to it is, is a huge support. And then also being transparent and communicating as policies and procedures change. I think that honesty and transparency and saying, you know, when you don't know goes a long way um, to help build that trust and community. Um, and with that, I'll just say thank you to you know, our whole uh, study team and all the folks who have helped to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in our schools. Um, and I will go ahead and turn it back over to Dr. Garnett as we bring on some more of our panelists. Great, thank you, Liz and Kelly. Um, I'm gonna introduce two additional um, panelists. Um, so uh, Sharon, would you like to give us a little a uh, few sentences about your background and how you're involved in the study. Hi, I'm Sharon Kendall. Uh, my son Jonathan attends Ackerman School in the Special School District. Um, I began participating in the study in um, fall of 2020 and mainly to give myself peace of mind and to have Jonathan continue learning in an environment that he was familiar with and that he was happiest in, um, I decided it'd be a great opportunity to um, participate in the study. I explained to him what the steps would be and assured him that everything is okay. And it's one of the best decisions that I've made. I get my email every Monday letting me know his results. Um, he's able to go to school, which he prefers. Um, he's able to go to school in person and everything is, is great. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Lisa, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm uh, Lisa Leonard Sneed. I'm the principal here at Ackerman School um, within the special school district. And I got the pleasure of working with Kelly and Tyler and their amazing team as they um, helped us through all that was COVID. Um, I took over my first year as the lead principal in 2020 with the onset of COVID. So I haven't known anything else. Um, <laughs> so I'm just real appreciative of their work and um, what we've accomplished as a partnership. Great, thank you. Um, you know, I'm gonna ask maybe you first, Lisa, what are, what are the main benefits of participating in the weekly testing for the staff um, at the school? Um, we were very appreciative to have the information, as Kelly mentioned, um, prior to students returning to school the next day. I was able to contact um, staff and families and start that whole process of contact tracing to keep kids safe and, and staff safe. So um, that first and foremost, just being able to get ahead of, of that and have people not return to the buildings that had tested positive was just a great benefit. Um, we also appreciated the weekly meetings with the Washington University team to kind of um, ask any questions um, or any concerns that we had um, to have those answered in a timely way so that we could also share that information with our staff. I have another question for anyone on the panel. Um, what are the most common challenges that students or families faced when participating in the testing? Um, one of the things here that's a little bit different about our building is we are not a community school. Um, we are not students homeschool. Um, we service students from Riverview Gardens, Jennings, Hazelwood, and Ferguson Florissant. Um, many times there has been um, some mistrust with the school because it is not their home school and they may have been placed in our building. So building relationships and rapport with families and developing a strong communication system so that we can um, build that trust to introduce different programming that's available to them was one of the things that we saw as kind of a, a barrier. Um, we had um, students continuously coming to our school. So even this week, I have five new students starting. So we have a very transient student population and just building relationships and getting people the um, information that they need sometimes can be a challenge for us. Great. Sharon, do you want to comment on what maybe influenced your decision to have your son participate in the study? I was contacted by Kelly and 
she couldn't have called me at a better time. Um, Jonathan was struggling so much with having to do virtual learning. He missed everybody. He missed the whole staff and everything. And I had to think about the different therapies and uh, even the support room that they have available. And um, she just happened to call me on an afternoon and told me about the study. And I don't think I even thought twice about it. I said, what's the harm in it? You know, if he'll be able to go to school and be safe, if he'd be able to go to the school and be safe from um, possibly infecting other children or maybe even his teachers, then what's the harm in participating in this? And um, I agreed to it. And he began it. I believe there was one uh, week also, I think they were on break, where they came to the house and tested him. Everything has been smooth sailing. It took him about a week or so to get used to it, but he expects it every week. I get my email every week, like I said. And um, it was more so of a, what else can we do? you know, in this situation to make sure that the environment is safe for him and for him to be able to continue going to school in person. That was his preference. Virtual school didn't work for him. But I'll be honest, if this program had not been available, I'm not sure how we would have gotten through the rest of 2020, um, going into 2021. And it was just one of those things where it could be kind of scary to begin with because you don't exactly know how it's going to turn out. But I'm glad that the decision was made. Thank you all so much for reaching out to me. And um, everything is great every week. Thank you. That's great, Sharon. And I'll just add some of the benefits that parents and staff shared with us to, um, to Sharon's point that the testing team has been really adaptive and flexible to meet the unique needs of each student. And you know, even doing home visits um, or adding a second day where folks could drop off their sample and then that could be picked up. So meeting that schedule um, and also just meeting folks where they're at, um, as well as I think there's the convenience of the location of testing. So for many parents, they didn't have to worry about, you know, when their student would get tested because you knew it would get taken care of as a part of their routine at school. And also during a time, you know, recently when testing wasn't readily available in the community, um, folks shared that it was really comforting to know that, okay, I'm going to have that access to that testing, even when Walgreens and CVS are out of, of that supply. I can jump in with a few comments too about barriers. Um, and it was, it's really comforting to hear that this has been such a good program for your family, Sean. I'm glad to hear that. Um, so one, one yeah. thing that we had additionally, or initially counted on was that for those students that might struggle with providing a sample, we'd um, be able to allow them to collect it at home and send it in their backpacks on the bus. So we were never able to, to make that happen where um, they were permitted to transport their saliva samples on the bus. So um, that was kind of one, one of those moments where we had to really flex and try to figure out how to, to make that work. Um, so that's something to consider. Um, but also I think just the whole research aspect was a barrier for many families, um, it was a barrier and that, you know, it was such a long consent process and just um, sometimes people didn't have the time or it was hard to catch people on the phone. Um, but, and, and also just suspicion about research, I think with certain populations, um, considering, you know, some of the, the dark history of research um, with disabled populations, with the African-American population. Um, so that was something that was definitely a barrier um, I think, you know, if this could be integrated as a school service, a school health service, um, it would probably remove some of those barriers. It was just something the school offered outside of like a research study. So I have a question that, um, as to whether any of you have thoughts on how, um, what kind of recommendations can we take into general population schools to accommodate kids with special needs while COVID is prevalent in our community? 
We um, really had a lot of luck um, thinking through routines and procedures that are common throughout our school day. So instead of having open times to use the restroom, restroom breaks were scheduled so that cleaning could occur in between classrooms, especially classrooms of students that had multiple disabilities. Um, we also kind of um, are still sticking to our cohort groups. So we um, made um, cohort groups at the beginning of the year. We we're still carrying those through. Um, that's been highly successful. So those students attend all their special area classes together so that we're not um, and recess together so that those common times where kids are in transition are shared with the much smaller population of students. So my recommendation for a general education setting might to be think through your systems and where your transitions and where you have large group of students that that are getting together and how might you um, make that um, a smaller amount and familiar faces throughout the year. Anyone else have any other comments on how to how to bring this back to general population schools. So I have another question. So where do we go from here? What sort of mitigation strategies should remain in place for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities um, during the next school year? I'll just speak to my staff. Um, my staff really do like um, the, the cohorts that we created, both with um, restroom breaks, the specialized um, areas of our um, elective courses and the recess. Um, some things that we've talked about, we have not opened up our cafeteria as of yet. Um, people are still um, choosing to have lunch and breakfast in the classrooms. So we're looking at um, spacing and again, using the designated cohorts in the lunchroom. Um, we're also looking at um, with our district level team, um, masking strategies. So now we have new stipulations around masking and when masks are needed and when they are not needed. Um, we're also um, looking at for next year, um, what different um, programming is going to look like. Some programming was not done last year because of, and, and if that programming will be brought back. Great, I'll, I'll add just from some of what parents and staff have shared as well. Um, I think we've learned a lot about flexibility and the need to kind of plan for that um, to the extent possible. So having those options for virtual instruction days kind of built into the school year, I know is um, something that's changing moving forward. Um, and then as long as COVID is prevalent in our communities, um, having access to that testing and um, especially I think the trust that's been developed between the members of the testing team and this program um, to be able to kind of reach out and uh, have that personal connection to the team to say what's going on and what should I do. Um, so to continue that those relationships um, to the extent possible so that you know we can be there to support one another as as the pandemic continues to evolve. And we were really fortunate using some of our COVID relief funds to be able to provide Chromebooks that go home with students and stay at home so that if we do need to switch what we call to a alternative method of instruction or an AMI day, we're able to do so seamlessly without having to worry about if students have what they need at home to continue learning. One thing I would add is, and it sounds like Lisa, you all are considering this in, in your plans, um, but I know we're all relaxing on masking lately. And I would say it's such an effective way to uh, stop the spread of COVID when you're in close proximity to people, um, not to give up on that too soon, especially when you can't social distance. Um, I'm thinking especially about um, staff, you know, and students where the students can't mask very easily themselves and they might have symptoms, um, OTs, PTs, and people to help with toileting and things like that, where you have to be in close proximity with these students, people providing those services um, might especially want to consider uh, to continue masking, especially if they are the students exhibiting symptoms. Yes. I'll add that if anyone in our audience has any 
questions, feel free to type those into the chat if you're joining us via Zoom. Um, we're happy to bring those to the forefront. Um, I'll, I'll add here, it looks like we have a question from one of our audience members. Um, how could we involve parents in what their children are doing at school? Is there any kind of telemedicine program that could help parents to be part of the school's intervention to know what to do when the kids are at home? I think that first question is really, really critical. How do you involve parents in what's happening at schools? Um, yeah, please. Yeah, so, yeah we um, that's something that is just a passion of ours. Um, we were hoping to do home visits this school year. And of course, due to the due to the COVID, we were unable to do so. But we are really striving to um, have frequent um, touch points with parents so that we can um, get the information out in a timely way. So um, home visits throughout the school year. We also um, have parent advisory uh, team that helps us to make some determinations on what went well with our curriculum, what went well um, with, we from curriculum to what went well when we had to um, send people home for COVID. So all just the wide variety, we get feedback um, about every two months from staff on all those pieces that my family engagement team uses throughout the school year to make determinations for next, next year and practices. Sharon, do you have any thoughts on how to, how to, how parents should be engaged in, in what's happening at school? Uh, my advice would be to um, stay in communication with, your your child's teacher seeing communication with uh, of the school participate in any events that they may have going on not just to show up and be there but so that you can connect because you never know who you may be speaking to and how often they interact with your child um it's been mentioned several times that the trust factor you know is what makes this success it's it's really that the trust factor you have to make sure that your child trusts who whose care that he or she is in every day you have to make sure that the environment that they are in is um comfortable is it, it it really goes hand in hand parents we have to open up and trust that there may be individuals who want to do the best thing possible for your child and given you know history, as mentioned, there are some things that we just have to open up and be comfortable with because you never know how your child may benefit. What we don't necessarily understand with certain things, particularly COVID, is that while we're trying to keep our children safe, we're not thinking about the fact that the child may not be successful with being home and we just want them home and safe with us so we have to find a common ground somewhere and and just say okay i'm just going to trust you i'm going to stay in communication with teachers with principals with those that are participating in the study if i'm not sure about it or if i want to know what's going on communication is is key it builds the trust. It's what makes this whole thing possible. There has to be that there for this to be possible. So I would just say to parents, just, just be open, respond. If you see an email, respond. Phone call, even if you're not sure of the number, respond. Just listen to what, what's said to you and just think about it and, and heavily consider it because it may be one of the best decisions that you make for your child. Great. I think that trust has definitely been key and a lot that we've heard from our parents, not only for, you know, especially for students with disabilities for whom that consistency and building into that routine is important for them, but also just for us to connect with one another and to develop that trust over time. I don't think any of us necessarily expected that we would still be testing at this point. <laughs> um, and, but here we are, you know, and Kelly and, and Dr. Garnett and their team have been continuing to show up. Mm -hmm. So another question um, from the audience, just wondering about um, 
vaccination. So is it recommended to continue with the testing after being fully vaccinated um, against COVID-19? Maybe um, Dr. Gernett and Kelly could speak to some of the science behind that. Yeah, the, you know, some of it will depend on whether the vaccines are effective against the viral strains that develop in the next year and years. Um, it's, you know, so, so certainly the testing also has to be accurate for the viral strain that's going around. Um, and so some of you are familiar with antigen testing as well as PCR testing. Those really do depend on those being um, able to identify the virus. Um, so I think there's going to be a, an important role, not only for vaccinations, but for testing. Um, both of those really need to continue in the next, for as long, it, probably indefinitely, this, but now that the cat's out of the bag, it's kind of like uh, we have another influenza, you know, what we've always done for influenza, we will be doing for coronavirus forever. I, I would just add that um, we do know too that, and we've seen it in our study, that you can still become infected with COVID-19 and still uh, pass it on if you're, um, if you're vaccinated. And since there are so many people out in the community still unvaccinated um, for many different reasons, it's, it's a good idea, I think, to continue testing, to think about, uh, or at least to have these people in mind as we uh, continue. Well, can I get a system for reference during 25? So I'll, um, I'll ask another question here. So if, if, as Kelly mentioned in your slides, not all staff and students are participating in this weekly testing, um, can you speak a little bit to the efficacy of the mitigation strategy of this testing program? Uh, yeah, something I can say, especially um, with students that were nonverbal, we were able to catch multiple instances uh, where they were uh, where they were positive, and uh, we would not have known necessarily they were asymptomatic or just seemed kind of blah. Um, but so we were able to catch that early on. We were also able to catch a lot of um, staff members that were pre-symptomatic. So I think having that and, and catching that early um, probably could have um, saved us from bigger outbreaks in the schools. Okay. We have time for a couple more questions, but um, it'd be helpful to maybe hear to, from everyone on this one. What is one key takeaway that will be important to remember as we continue to move through this pandemic and into the school years? I think it's an important takeaway is to, to really think about who's the most vulnerable in our society and uh, determine ways of getting resources to make sure that those people aren't left out as um, the impact is so much greater on different populations. So that, that to me is so critical in how we design interventions and ability to get help to individuals in our community. Um, personally, and from what I've witnessed, I just take great uh, comfort in the fact that uh, there were people showing up every day, like even during the worst of it, like people kept showing up, the teachers kept showing up for school, um, despite all the fears that we were constantly having communicated to us for themselves, for their families, for their students, um, parents trusting, um, uh, you know, us and there's the staff at the schools to ensure, um, you know, their children were loved and saved. I safe. I think um, it was just a really great takeaway. And that's just for me personally, <laughs> from what I've witnessed, but it's so hopeful in a really, really dark and difficult time to see that. I will totally give a shout out to the teachers and all the staff, everyone at the school, the schools, they're tremendous. They're my heroes. Um, my takeaway was um, vulnerability. Um, I did not have all the answers as a school leader um, going through this and being able to um, communicate and depend on others for answers that I did not have um, was tough because you're on the, on, the, on the scene and 
supposed to be a problem solver, but this one kind of superseded us. So um, being able to collaborate and communicate and just be vulnerable and say, I don't have all the answers right now, but we're working really hard to keep kids safe here. Ron, what about for you? Um, I would like to piggyback on what Dr. Leonard Sneed just said, um, as far as working collectively, um, as far as not having all the answers and just choosing to come together and make this success, this as successful as possible during this uh, very trying time. Um, my other takeaway, I didn't think about it from this perspective since you know, every student has a different ability. Jonathan is, is autism, even though he doesn't struggle with the tests. My takeaway is that um, you guys just enlightened me that there's more than one way to do it. Um, with the kids deciding, even if some of them decide to take their own saliva, I never thought about it from that standpoint, um, even the, the nasal swab. Um, so I guess the takeaway is to kind of believe in ab the ability of your children. You just never know what they'd be willing to do, what they can do to make something like this uh, happen for them to ensure their safety. So not only does there need to be a trust in those and okay. those who work with your children, but trust in your kid. Thanks. That's a wonderful, wonderful note to end on. I don't know if anyone can top that, but if there's any final words uh, to the rest of our panelists, I'll let you share those. Otherwise, um, I'll, I'd like to say thanks to Janet Gillow and the Brown School for inviting us to open classroom. And thanks to everyone who has been attending here today to learn about the important work of this group as we continue to move through this pandemic and um, just to hear a little bit about all the great work that's happening in the special school district. Uh, so thanks everyone for being here. And um, if there's no further final words, um, then we can say our goodbyes, but thanks everyone. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Bye.